Good morning, everybody. It is so good to be with you here this morning. My name is Ted. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Encounter Church. And you may not know this. Maybe you did. I found this out earlier today, and so I am celebrating with wearing sandals. Today is officially the first day of spring. Oh, it is good to have some warm weather. Uh, but all of that aside, it is so good to be with you all here this morning. Uh, if you are here for the first time today, first of all, welcome. It is so good to have you here with us. Just want to let you know a couple things. Um, following the service, if you head out these back double doors and turn to the right, uh, you'll see our welcome center. Some very friendly people there would love to greet you. They would love to say hi. They would love to answer any questions that you might have about the church. Uh, and we have a gift to give you just for saying thank you for choosing to be here with us this morning. Uh, uh, but then also at that Welcome Center or at our information table by the front uh, glass doors, you can pick up one of our Connect cards. Uh, looks like this. This is a great way for you to get plugged in. If you've never filled one of these out uh, or if some of your information might have changed, please fill one out uh, with as much information as you're comfortable. Uh, you can get on our weekly email various events coming up. You can write down prayer requests. You can write down comments. Uh, it's a great way for all of those sorts of things. Fill one of those out, and then you can drop them in our offering drop boxes, which are just through these double doors uh, heading out of the, the auditorium. Uh, but if you prefer to use electronics, uh, you can fill out a Connect card on our app. Uh, uh, download the app. It's a great way uh, to look at the events coming up. You can also connect with us via the app, uh, watch sermons, all that kind of stuff. It's a really, really the great uh, resources. So I just want to let you know about those things uh, that are available. Uh, and now we are going to transition into a time of worship. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over to the worship band. Welcome, 
Blessed be your name. Come on, sing this with me. Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful, the stream of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near for the wages of our guilty sin was death, but the free gift of God's eternal life is Jesus Christ our living home. 
yourself for our sins. Thank you for loving us in spite of ourselves. Thank you that while we were still sinners, yet you came for us. Lord, I pray that as Pastor Vern comes and speaks to us today, that you would soften our hearts and our spirit, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us in the places, in the deep places where we need to hear. I pray that you would convict us of things that we're doing that we aren't listening to you, that we would turn away from those things and that we would follow you. Thank you that you're a God of, of grace and mercy and second chances. And I pray that we would continue to lay the things of the flesh aside and follow you, Jesus, every day of our lives. We love you, Jesus. We give you today, tomorrow, and the rest of our lives. And so much uncertainty, we place it on you. You are certain. You are forever. We love you, God. Amen. You may be seated. And the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is pleased when you glorify Christ in your life. Now, the Bible says that you can sin against the Holy Spirit. The Bible says you can anger the Spirit. The Bible says you can grieve the Spirit. The Bible says you can lie against the Holy Spirit. The Bible says you can tempt the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that you can resist the Holy Spirit. And if you resist the Holy Spirit, there's no forgiveness. Because you see, it's the Holy Spirit that draws you to Christ. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts you of your need of Christ. And if you resist him, keep resisting. Your heart getting harder and harder all the time. No more salvation. There's only one way of salvation, and that's Christ. A solemn thing to resist the Holy Spirit. You detect His voice, and yet you deliberately refuse. It's a dangerous thing to resist the Spirit. He that despiseth Moses' law died without mercy unto two or three witnesses. Of how much sore a punishment suppose ye shall be, thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God, and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and had done despite unto the spirit of grace i'm asking you to give in to the call of the holy spirit nice to see you first day of spring isn't this good the weather is sort of cooperating with the notion uh, I've got a picture here from out of my uh, long ago past. Do you want to show that, guys? Well, I thought it might come up on the back screen. You see that? Oh, thank you. I used to be. <laughs> and uh, both of us... Uh, you know, when I look at this, this is 49 years ago. We celebrated our 49th anniversary on Friday. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. My wife says to me before I'm getting ready to come up, are you going to make me stand up? <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah, it looks so surreal because I can't quite believe we were ever that young. That's amazing. 49 years ago. Well, we're still kicking. Uh, only one more to get to the big one, but I figure that's in the hands of my children, and if they come through, fine. If they don't, fine, and um, whatever. Uh, we're going to show you, well, first question. Any Clint Eastwood fans in the audience? Uh oh, go ahead and make my day. <laughs> This is a short clip from his movie, Unforgiven, so you understand the connection with today's sermon. Go ahead. It don't seem real. I ain't gonna never breathe again, ever. I was dead. And the other one, too. All on account of pulling the trigger. It's a thing killing a man. It 
take away all he's got and all he's ever gonna have. Yeah. Well, I guess they had it coming. We all have it coming, kid. Well, I wanted that last line. Um, it's, for me, a classic from Clint Eastwood. We all got it coming, kid. But it also brings up the question, what do you do when we've all got it coming? where we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So here's this young kid grieving over the fact that he's shot and killed a couple of guys. And then he tries to justify himself a little bit by, well, I guess they had it coming, outlaws, you know. And Clint puts kind of a stamp of recognition on all of us. We all got it coming. So we'll talk about sin and specifically the unforgivable sin today. I'm going to take you on a, maybe a roundabout route. <clears throat> so I grew up, <clears throat> as you know, in North Dakota. And Lewis and Clark, in their journeys of 200 plus years ago to the Pacific Ocean from the eastern side of this continent, made a stop in North Dakota about 150 miles from the place where I grew up. It's now known as Mandan or thereabouts, North Dakota, fairly close to Bismarck. The journeys of Lewis and Clark have always fascinated me in recent years. I didn't grow up with that, even though I grew, uh, lived so close to where they had stopped. But um, in recent years, and my wife and I have made a, an attempt to trace their journeys by car. They're on river bottoms, but we're in the car. But all these miles. And just if you follow the highway, it's about a 2,500 mile journey for where they launched in St. Louis or just north of St. Louis, a little place called Wood River, Illinois. 2,500 miles by boat, by canoe, by horseback, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Now, what a journey! Their journey went from 1803 to 1806. Three years, almost three years by the time they get back to St. Louis. They took 45 men, mostly soldiers. They experienced one death within a few days of launching their trip when Sergeant Floyd uh, apparently had a case of acute appendicitis and died, and there's a monument there now. 2,500 miles into the unknown, where white people had never been before. 2,500 miles by boat, by canoe, by horse, no maps. There were native encounters, some of them friendly, some of them hostile. There are natural obstacles, of course. Rivers have rapids and falls. There was all sorts of trouble with weather. No maps, no guide, just a river. And follow the river until there is no more river and cross what we know as a continental divide and get to the other side and find a new river. Well, it wasn't that easy. In my own uh, kind of fantasy world, there are two trips I wish I could have taken. This is one of them. The other would be, and forgive me, I, I grew up in the 60s and uh, the moon, you know, astronauts. Uh, I doubt if I would have relished either one of those trips, but it, the fantasy side with me would have said, this would be a great experience, and I'm sure it would have been. Well, in the winter of 1804 and 1805, they spend about four months in North Dakota. It's winter. You're not going anywhere. The river is frozen, and as soon as the river starts breaking up, they move the next spring. But they spend this time with a tribe of Hadatsa Indians. And in that company, they discover a French fur trader called Charbonneau and his young Indian wife, Sacagawea. Your history books have probably told you about her. She's probably 16, thereabouts. And in their time there in North Dakota, she bears 
a son, her firstborn, in February of that year. Lewis and Clark hire these two along with the young son to go with them as a guide, as an interpreter, as some help along the way. Probably their biggest accomplishment in having these three along, mother and father and baby Pomp, as they called him, was the fact that they could encounter unknown tribes, unknown hostilities, and defuse that. This isn't a war party. We've got a mother and child here. And so they make their way. I'm using the story because they, they need to have a guide. They need to know kind of how to negotiate their trip west. And they've been told, you're going to need horses to cross the Continental Divide. Boats won't work. There are no rivers anymore. And so they're hoping that these can provide some interpretation and be able to contact Indians that might be able to give them horses. They get to the Continental Divide by August of that year through much ordeal, finally make contact with the Shoshone tribe of Indians. And one of the most amazing coincidences happens in the history of the American experience. Sacagawea has come from this tribe. She was sold into slavery with the Hadatsas where they first met in North Dakota. When they meet the Shoshone Indians, Sacagawea recognizes her brother. And what have, could have been a, a difficult, even hostile, deadly encounter turns into a family reunion of sorts. And they get their horses, and they even recruit an Indian guide to make their way across the mountains in Idaho. So an amazing story of a guide. The success often attributed to Sacagawea. Just her presence, but also then this encounter with the uh, Shoshone Indians. Well, when we think about guides, the Bible describes the Holy Spirit as a guide to lead us into the truth. And so the Holy Spirit is there to be our guide into the unknown where there are no maps. You know, your life gets lived as you experience it, not maybe as you wanted to, but the way it is. And nobody else can live your life, and so you need guidance. We all do. So this is a guide. We have a word, yes, the Bible. It is a written word, and so it needs interpretation, it needs understanding, it needs background, it needs context, all those things. We have a living word, we call him Jesus. But even the written and the living word both need the Holy Spirit to translate for us. Well, what's this all about? What does it mean? To guide us, as John's Gospel says, into all truth. We need the Holy Spirit. So our lives are full of dangers, enemies, we call them the world, the flesh, and the devil, obstacles, no maps, confusion, disorientation, disinformation, and so how do we make our way? So Jesus left his disciples with some instructions just before his arrest and crucifixion. He says in John 14, if you love me, obey my commandments. All right, if you're going to get guided by God, there are some commandments that say, do this and don't do that. Good. Verse 16 says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. So Jesus understands our problem. We can easily be misled fall of false information. We can easily be overtaken by our own selfish ambition, go our own way, thank you very much, rather than following God's way. So the Holy Spirit for us is critical. It's his presence, it's his discernment, it's his leading us into God's way and into God's salvation. But then we come up against this notion that you can so wound or alienate the Holy Spirit that you are guilty of an unforgivable sin. I chose that 
Clint Eastwood clip because the movie is called Unforgiven. So how does that happen? Well, there's a scripture. Mark chapter 3, the teachings of Jesus. One time Jesus entered a house and the crowds began to gather again. And soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. Now listen to this, his own family. They tried to take him away and they said he's out of his mind. Different translations put that differently. One of them says he was beside himself. He's not himself. He's lost his senses. These are kind of polite ways of saying he's out of his mind. He's insane. He's mad. The teachers of the law, a religious law, who had arrived from Jerusalem said, well, he's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. Now, Jesus lives his life and teaches his teachings in such a way that we are constantly brought up against the question, who is this man? You remember those stories like the one of him being asleep in the bottom of the boat while a storm comes up ready to swamp the boat, capsize it and kill them all, drown them all. And the disciples panic. And Jesus gets up and rebukes the wind and the waves and the seas calm down, the winds die down, and they're saved. But now they've got a problem. Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? Well, he's out of his mind, according to some. He's possessed by the devil, according to the teachers of the religious law. Is he good or is he evil? Does he have miraculous powers to use for bad reasons, for evil intentions? Is he the devil? Is he a messiah? Or is he a deceiver? Who is this man? Now Jesus is quick to understand their problem. Why in the world, in essence, is he saying, would you call me in league with the devil? So let me read on. Jesus called them over and responded with an illustration. How can Satan cast out Satan? He's asking them, pay attention, guys. Think. Use your brain. A kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how will he stand? He will never survive. And let me illustrate further, he says, who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. And then he gets to the heart of it. Verse 28, Mark chapter 3. I tell you the truth. All sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. So there's something uniquely devastating about a sin against the Holy Spirit. And we'll get into the specifics of why in a moment. But at this point, simply to recognize that there is such a thing. And so that we need to understand exactly what it is and how to avoid it. Now I'm going to take you, and I believe they'll project it here, to the same verses Mark 3, 28 and 29 from the message translation, which paints the picture in my mind perfectly. Eugene Peterson is so creative with this. So he has Jesus say this. Listen to this carefully. I'm warning you. There's nothing done or said that can't be forgiven. That's the good news. But if you persist in your slanders against God's Holy Spirit you are repudiating the very one who forgives, sawing off the branch on which you were sitting, severing by your own perversity all connection with the one who forgives. He gave this warning because they were accusing him of being in league with evil. So, it puts it just right, in my opinion. 
The Holy Spirit is there to draw you, to enlighten you, to lead you into all truth, to guide you all the way to your destination with God in heaven. In the Lewis and Clark sense, to guide you all the way to the Pacific Ocean. The Holy Spirit is there to lead you and to draw you and connect you. So first, the good news that I made a brief reference to, there is, and they are, they'll show this slide, there is a wideness in God's mercy. All the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven. All of them. There is not a sin you can do in word or deed that God won't forgive. So what's unforgivable? Well, anyone who speaks a word against me is forgiven, Jesus says, in another place. So here's this one and only exception. If the Holy Spirit is there to guide you, to lead you, to draw you, to point you in the right direction, and you say no, I'll do it my way, or I'll do it somebody else's way. It's not that you've committed a deed that is terrible and needs to be punished. It's that you've decided you don't need God. You've decided that you know better than what the Holy Spirit has to offer. You've decided to do it your way instead of God's way. So what is the Holy Spirit? God sends, or what is the sin against the Holy Spirit? God sends his Spirit to do this, to teach you, to guide you, to lead you, to draw you, and you say no. The problem left to myself is I'm easily lost, disoriented. You ever wake up and drive somewhere unfamiliar and think you're going north, but you're actually going south? Now, it doesn't usually happen if the sun is shining. But if there's a cloud cover, which way is north, which way is south, or east or west, doesn't matter. But left to myself, I do that. I'm ignorant of way too much. I believe lies sometimes. This world is filled with lies and disinformation. And the worst part of it is, I am self-centered. That is the definition of sin. It's that I in the middle of sin. That's the problem. It's me. Ego. Ambition. So out of that self-centeredness, I need a guide. There's a quote from Helen Keller that I love. The only thing worse, she says, than blindness is to have sight and refuse to see. Well, she's captured again the notion of what the unforgivable sin is. God has given us his guidance, his leading into all truth, and we've decided we'd rather not. And I could add to what Helen has said, the only thing worse than deafness is ears but refusing to hear. Or the only thing worse than muteness is having the ability to speak but have nothing to say. And so we got a problem and we need to deal with it. The Holy Spirit is our eyes and our ears, our discernment, our wisdom. But if I reject it, I reject God's way, God's truth, God's persuasion, God's key to life and salvation. And then I'm on my own, without a map, without a guide. So understand this, and don't miss it, because some people get very confused. Well, could I have committed the unforgivable sin? It's not some terrible deed. It's not some horrendous rejection of God. It's simply to say, I know better than God, and I'll do it myself. Thank you very much. God knows. God knows all of your sins and mine, and they're all forgiven. Every last one of them. So we are given with God's presence in our lives and with God's wisdom and God's word. Real choices. Real choices. But real choices, if they are real choices, have real consequences. So God sends help to guide me, the Holy Spirit. And when I reject that, think of a person who's drowning. And they are sent a lifeline, a rope or something. And they say, oh, no, I'll do this on my own, thank you. Well, how foolish. I don't know, do I have enough time for a joke? <laughs> All right, thank you. I'll try to make it brief. 
So there's a flood, and there's a man in his house, and the street is full of water, and a man with a big four-wheel drive comes driving by and says, you want a ride? I'll take you. No, no. No, I'm praying. God said he'll provide. The water's up to the first floor. He's on the second floor now. A boat comes by. Can we take you out? No, no, no. God said he's going to provide. I'm trusting God. Pretty soon he's on his roof. And he's on his roof and a helicopter comes by. And he says, no, no, I'll, I'm good. God said he'll take care of me. God will provide. Well, finally he drowns. And he goes to heaven and he confronts St. Peter. You said you'd provide. What happened? Well, we sent three people. What do you want? <laughs> well, you know the problem. And you've probably heard it before, too. Well, real choices with real problem. I need a guide, and that's the Holy Spirit. If I have eyes to see but refuse to see, that is a moral or a sin problem. It's not just ignorance now. I have made a choice, and choices have real consequences. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, me, the sin problem in me. But the gift of God is eternal life. Think for a moment, if you would, about sin as a disease. And I'm not sure that's the best way to describe sin, but it's one way. I'm not well. I have this disease. It's called sin. And when a doctor or someone is trying to figure out this disease they will look into the pathology of this disease. What are the origins of this thing? What are the causes and the effects of this disease? And when you discover that in this case, the sin disease has me as the problem. And what does Jesus do when he calls us to himself? The first thing he asks of them is, you must deny yourself, which is absolutely against everything I want to do for myself. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Anyone who wants to be first, Jesus also says, must be last. Well, I don't know about you, that's counterintuitive. Why would I want to be last? But Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you want to have your life modeled after mine, you want to have the Holy Spirit at work in your life leading you into all truth, that's the way this works. You see it illustrated with Jesus' parables, the prodigal son. So he has this occasion to say, I want to do it on my own. Father, give me my share of the inheritance. He goes to the far country, blows it. And finally, the scripture is so descriptive here, comes to his senses. Well, I would suggest that the Holy Spirit has finally got his attention in his poverty, in his weakness. So the cure, the cure for this disease is simply faith. And what's the Holy Spirit to do? It's to draw you to faith, to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 2 is the story of a paralytic, bedridden. Four men bring him. There's a crowd. They open up the roof above. I'm sure the homeowner appreciated that one. But the authorities object. When Jesus says to this young man, on his bed, your sins are forgiven. I don't know if the young man wanted to hear that. He probably wanted to hear what his friends probably thought. Well, he can heal. He'll stand up and walk. But I want you to know, Jesus says, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And he tells the man to get up and walk. So here's this sin that cripples me. And Jesus' offer, follow me, get up and take your bed and walk. Which is it going to be? Well, when I put it in those stark terms, you know which one you have to choose. But we don't often get that black and white image. We sometimes get this notion, well, I know what it says, but I really still do want to do it my way. The real choice then boils down to Jesus, authority, life, healing, salvation, or no, I'd rather do it my way. When the Holy Spirit is at work, Jesus lives and teaches and heals and forgives and invites. And you know some people rejected that. And in this case that I read earlier, he's possessed. That's what's going on here. He's possessed. 
So Jesus lives and teaches and gives us all these things, and the Holy Spirit is there to draw us and persuade us. The unforgivable part is simply and only this, to say no to that. Now, perhaps you have this question, is it possible to have said no in the past Is it once and done um, beyond redemption? Absolutely not. God forgives upon forgives upon forgives. When the question came to him, is it 70 times 7 you forgive? Jesus responds about how many times? People with addictions often struggle with this. Well, can I fail one more time? Can I fall off the wagon one more time and still... Oh... The forgiveness never stops. And the rejection of Christ never stops. But if you forgive that, think of the Apostle Paul as one who knew the way of salvation. He knew the law. He knew the word of God better than any of us will ever know it. And he'd been in on the circle to kill one of the early disciples. Can he be forgiven? Well, obviously he could be. He'd been saying no all of his life until the road to Damascus. And all of a sudden, the light turns on. So there's no point at which you're beyond the work of salvation and forgiveness. One final note here. The Holy Spirit uses you as a part of his army to tell the message of God's love and forgiveness. He uses you, he uses me, he uses all of us. And so this final slide, the Church of Christ at Encounter at Work. The Holy Spirit is ready and willing and able to engage, to equip, to inform, to motivate, to provide his gifts to do this work, to draw us to Jesus, our salvation. In Hebrews, and Brock put this in the worship set. Verse 22 again, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts fully trusting him for our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. Our bodies have been washed with pure water. He's done everything needed to set the slate clean and pure and clean to follow him. So let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways, and here's the you and I part of what the Holy Spirit is doing. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do. That's why you meet here on Sunday morning. Does the pastor give you a great sermon every Sunday? I wouldn't even presume to think such a thing. But you come to encourage each other to learn, to listen, to share, to bless each other. So let us not neglect meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We are called to be God's workmen. And the Holy Spirit has given you and you and you all the gifts needed to get the work done. So he's willing to use us. The Holy Spirit is willing to come into your life and guide you wherever you need to go, whatever God has called you to do. I don't know who said this, but I, I've been fond of quoting it for a lot of years now. Listen closely. Both heaven and hell are populated by forgiven sinners. Hell is reserved for those who say no to God's offer to save. So my appeal to you is, please say yes. My challenge to you this week is simple. Simply to know that there are people in your life, and maybe you're even one of them here, who are deeply troubled by your past and by the sins of the past. And so I'm just asking you to, every day this week, just remember your brothers and sisters 
in church or outside the church who are deeply troubled by their past and ask God to show them the way to forgiveness and healing. Lord Jesus, your gospel is such good news. All the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven. But then that correction or that warning, be careful. Lord, we're here to be careful, to listen to the proddings of your Holy Spirit, to be willing to take up our lives in such a direction that we are following those promptings and that you are showing us the way. You are our guide. Without you, we'd be lost. So, Lord, today we affirm it again. Show us the way. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand with us, church. Please join me in a prayer. Father God, we are so thankful for Jesus, what he did on the cross. Lord, when put in this context and in this uh, situation that we talked about this morning, it just makes the gift that you gave us so unbelievable that you would do that, that you would forgive us time and time and time and time again. No matter what we've done in our past, you forgive us no matter what? No matter the pain, no matter the shame, no matter the 
torture that sometimes we put ourselves through, you say, give that to me. I've paid for that on the cross already. You don't have to carry that. That's not yours. Give it to me. Father, thank you for this good news. Lord, may we walk out of here this morning encouraged, light, perhaps lighter than we've felt in years. Father, thank you for for your forgiveness. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the guide that it is in our lives. In the powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Pastor Vern, thank you for that message this morning, the encouragement that that is to me personally and hopefully to to all of us here uh, that we're able to hear that. Just to remind of his takeaway is to be in prayer. Be in prayer today for those who are perhaps struggling with sins of the past, things that have happened, pain and shame and guilt that people are carrying. Pray for them. Pray for each other. Pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ as well, that we would all be encouraged by what God has done for us. Amen. And now if you would turn your attention uh, just briefly to the screens for some final announcements this morning. family, I have a few announcements for you this week. Prayer worship testimony night is this Saturday at the church in the lobby at 7 p.m. Make sure you invite your friends, family, and neighbors to this event where we'll be taking time to come before the Lord in prayer and worship and hearing testimonies. Our worship and baptism is next Sunday, March 27th. There is still time to sign up, but all signups and information are due by tomorrow. Calling all kids and youth on Sunday, April 3rd, Nathan from Kenbrook Bible Camp will be coming to Encounter to speak during Impact in the morning on Kenbrook Summer Camps. There will also be a table set up in the Kids Connection all morning with information. If you have any questions on any of these announcements, feel free to contact the church office. Love you, church family. See you next week. So just a quick recap, this Friday, not Saturday, this Friday is our worship and prayer night here at the church, and then Sunday is our baptism celebration. If you have never been baptized as a believer, and that is something you are feeling called to do, let us know. You can still sign up by tomorrow. Sign up, and we will be in contact with you, and we'll get you all squared away. It's going to be an absolutely amazing Sunday. Next Sunday, you won't want to miss it. Uh, And then as we're heading out, just want to let you guys know, um, just if you have any kind of prayer concern or anything that you would love prayer for over here by our prayer banner there would be a team of people that would love to pray with you and for you so make sure you go over and see that Uh, and our offering drop boxes are in the back Uh, thank you Thank you to each and every one of you that continues to give back to God. We are only able to do what we do here on a Sunday morning uh, because of your faithfulness and generosity of giving back to God. So thank you so much for that. Uh, The offering boxes are in the back. Um, Pray that you guys have a fantastic week. Go in the Lord, and we'll see you back next Sunday. God bless.